so uh, I'm going to be presenting tonight on uh, this topic called On the Road to a Gay-Centered Psychology. Because uh, Roger is kind of alluding to that as being more than something that just is simple or uh, easily answered. Though there can be simple or easy answers to such, uh, like dictionary definitions of such terms, if you choose them as mere terms. We need to focus on gayness, let's say. But what is gayness? That kind of begs a whole set of questions itself. And we can go from there, depending on how detailed we want to get about that. So, uh, in particular, though, I wanted to uh, focus on, uh, let's see, first of all, this lovely stick of incense. I'm so sorry, I had to burn it to get a little bit in the mood, because I'm going to be presenting on this book. It's a trio of things. I decided it's going to be a, we're in a, we're in a three part series, okay, and uh, it has to do with three works that I wrote a long time ago now the latest one, that's this one, it's from 1999, that's now a long time ago, and I'm going to get longer and longer as time goes on. This was, oops, this was the first one, I should have put myself, I didn't bring a holder, see, there's no holder, so my apologies, this was the first one, it's from 1977, so, but I was not satisfied with the level of development that represented in my own growth in 1977, so, in 1980, this is three new essays that I wrote between this, and this really represents my attempt, earlier attempt, to be psychologically minded from a post-Stonewall point of view. For at the time, meaning the mid, approximately the mid-70s, this is a long time ago now, and so that's what I spoke on last time. And tonight I'm going to be addressing this, I burn the incense. Because otherwise, if I was really respecting the mood or atmosphere, which is what would be meaningful about presenting on this work now, in my opinion, other than in a historical sense, assuming everyone who's related to that whole world from which this odd book comes will be physically dead. There will be no one left. This book was published in 1980. But again, it's a collection of three essays that were written starting in 76, 78, and 79. So it's actually really an earlier authorship it represents that later 70s period, really kind of in San Francisco, which was one of the epicenters of, uh, I don't know what to call it, a kind of queer subculture of the time. It was made up of various itself sub subcultures, you might call them, uh, within it. And this is a, a product of that kind of world, and it's a world which is now very distant, and will only continue, in my experience it's very distant, and only continue to get more and more distant, so this is a slight memoir, and I drop the bell, so I can't tinkle a little bell at you, but that would be another aspect. It, what it represents is a, a kind of um, wish to be in a time and space that is not controlled by uh, the, those who covertly exert power socially in a way that defines time and space, not to anyone's advantage except the rulers. So burn incense is, has that kind of political meaning, it has that kind of political meaning, not really to, to, to change the smell in the room. <laughs> <laughs> it has religious meanings or spiritual meanings as well. Those are other kinds of meanings, but I mean it specifically in its political sense. It's something to do with. So when one, one, one smells the smell, one is reminded of that one has the right to choose to work, at least work at creating another space and time than the one that the rulers would choose for one. Or from the viewpoint of one is just a slave of that rulership. Life we're born into, which is pretty much set up for us. So I don't, I don't have the. Um, this was a real common part of the, that world. So rather than all the rest of it, to really get it up, I, I first of all, I would, this is absolute horror. The way I'm dressed is total horror. And so I'd never be dressed like this. Such a betrayal of every value, almost every value. <laughs> Not really, but it almost it looks like almost every short hair. I'm screaming. I'm screaming. Trimmed beard, you know, <laughs> jeans. I'm like I'm hitting the roof. It's, like, it's awful. Like, it's a, in the 70s terms, this would be like a 
uber clone look. They didn't even think of things like a shaved head. It's quasi-shaved head like this, you know, back then. The Godfather is like this, you know, some little geezer with a half-shaved head, you know. So it's in enough, you know, that it passes. But for the standard of this time and place, it's completely, I'd be, so I'd be booted out <laughs> for how I'm dressed right now. Absolutely, unless I could, you know, show enough through my personality that I wasn't really what my clothes would have represented and my look would have represented back then. Not now, of course, which is a different time and place. But back then, it's how, how different things are, how much things have changed. I changed even a few years after this. I start to wear jeans. <laughs> I mean, <isn't> it? <laughs> <laughs> so it was a, related to the patriarchy to wear jeans. <laughs> so, I'm sorry, but I can't help but be amused by all the how political everything was at one time. It was just daily life. It wasn't something odd or different. It's not like you went home and lived someplace different than it was what was political versus now. It's only occurring when you have commercials or whatever, the pennies in the paper, or the political thing on the computer, or the vote. That's supposed to be political. Huh, all right. So uh, uh, I don't know what to do with this. Do you have any suggestion? Anything else? Thank you. It's very nice to have it around. So, uh, uh, Roger's already tied in this development of at least one branch of being able to get into what is being gay-centered or homosexual-centered, perhaps, or whatever. The words are not really that essential in the end, given to as need be issues, discussions of the word to terms themselves. But nonetheless, uh, same-sex-oriented uh, uh, kind of uh, feeling that is so centralized and important that it causes one to wind up having being interested on that basis to have some kind of definition of who one is that not only takes that into account but gives it the validity that it really brings to one. Now, it took me a long time to cultivate that kind of attitude towards my uh, this, this kind of urgefulness. I had to get over a lot of hang-ups of all kinds of layers and more fruitive and more subtle, uh, uh, both in my body and my thinking, to be able to to get a more of a handle on what I'm now describing to you. So I don't want it to sound like I just sort of got here magically or something to, in terms of whatever I'm saying, wherever I'm being right now, it has a whole history. And that's one reason that I'm really honored to be able to do this, because we got the tape in the record machine running, so it all gets recorded, because uh, like I said before, soon all the live players and all these kinds of scenes and situations will all be dead. That's okay, it's always like that, and new generations come up all the time. But nonetheless, uh, a lot is lost in that process, an awful lot, because the victors write the, the histories, to, usually, and that's not to uh, most people's advantage, unfortunately, whether we're aware of that or not, it's not that. <laughs> so uh, I had to go through a whole long journey myself. I, I sure grew up in a regular environment where uh, Homosexual was not uh, an sense of advantage. I've heard about a few cultures where it has been viewed that way, but usually not. Uh, it certainly wasn't in the world that I grew up in. Jeez. But for some odd reason, even from the age of 13, I became so aware of wanting to become psychologically minded, though I hated being homosexual, that I was able to use my hatred against being homosexual to into my first psychological encounter with some psychological training. I was 13 years old. I wouldn't tell my mother, but I got her to take me to go, go to the child guidance clinic, it was called. Still, the place still exists now. Uh, and I was the first person I came out to and I was uh, using, I was using, having this hangout to uh, 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 get more into understanding how this one came out. What, what might be called a psychological understanding, but that itself, that can have lots of different meanings or different things that it refers to. I'll try and get more particular about what that I experience that as as we go along, perhaps this evening. And, and so, uh, one way of looking at these three texts are uh, actually is a history of trying to become more psychological about being homosexually interested, strong such that that's quite predominant and determinant 
to what it's called. So uh, this is my first attempt, and now I'm going to talk about the second one. And I realized after I put these two together, okay, that um, it developed further, and so I have to throw in this pamphlet from 1999 and get a three-parter. It was going to be a two-parter, okay. But now it's become a three-parter, but not next month. We already have something for next month. And we already have something for the month after that, too. So perhaps in February, maybe, there might be the third part. So I'll be shocked if you see something. Third part, you know, the story one. But this represents sort of developing a more gay-centered psychological attitude. Okay. Uh, so uh, I thought to contextualize uh, this evening a little more, I might actually read to you the description of the evening. And to do that accurately, I should really read you the description from last month, which includes uh, the topic of tonight. So last, last month was, was this one, uh, this book I talked on. <clears throat> and it was uh, called The Genesis and Significance of Men Loving Men. So, how did this come about? Why, what, why was it significant? This was the blurb for it. As Mitch Walker struggled in young adulthood to come out of the closet as homosexual, he also became increasingly interested in combining his longtime interest in psychology with his growing gay sensibility. And one of the first results was Men Loving Men, a gay sex guide and consciousness book, which appeared in early 1977. More than being the first full-length work published by that particular press, Gay Sunshine Books, and San Francisco, or merely being a gay version of then available heterosexual, quote, sex guides, unquote, parenthesis is the introduction explains, and parenthesis. Men Loving Men is notable historically because of its concern with nurturing a transformative, procreative possibility in terms of what would later be called quote, gay affirmative, unquote, an attitude which continued to develop more intensively in the author himself, who then produced a subsequent book, Visionary Love, which concerns a gay-centered standpoint of further appreciative refinement, which went even then further later on, okay, after that. Uh, but uh, that gives you a little bit of the context of these two items. Uh, and I went into some extent last month uh, as to the, that world. This really kind of world so represents the world of earlier, my earlier coming out and adapting in the San Francisco gay world of that time, which, because I was interested in psychology, was uh, strongly, uh, heavily uh, um, um, I don't know, centered around Don Clark uh, and his uh, associates. Almost the first man to declare himself to be a homosexual as a psychologist. He's the first person to that officially to say, oh, I am homosexual, who was already a licensed psychologist. So historically the very first person to do that. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so uh, 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 I didn't know about him when he, before he, started, he did that, <coughs> but I soon found out about him and begged him. as well, and coming under this idea of, um, uh, kind of uh, applying humanism, basic humanistic feeling of quality to being homosexual. That was extremely revolutionary uh, at the time. Extremely. It still has a lot of love to it. To just such a basic tone, you know, to be, to be that simple and fundamental about uh, treating homosexual, whatever, the same as homosexual or whatever kind of way, so, uh, all uh, without um, uh, uh, favoritism to, to, to um, uh, unfair uh, power issues, as they will sort of be kind of see that and identify them. Okay, so that's last month. This month is uh, uh, the intent and promise of visionary love. Right? And we'll find out we're going to that next time. Uh, so we're going we're gonna to get into uh, the intent and promise of this. Is looks like this book, but is um, you see how it has a circle in the front, circle in the back. It's meant to have a hole through it. You read through it and you go through the tunnel kind of idea. It, it 
tries to play that out, and uh, it's uh, an early attempt to have it as the, as the actual experience.